Hi again, everyone, and welcome in to Cincinnati Bengals Talk. I'm James Rapine, and it's time to welcome in the man, special guest, Dave Lapham. Make sure you check out In the Trenches with Dave Lapham wherever you get your podcasts or right here on YouTube. Uh, Dave, I, I appreciate the time. Uh, there's a, a ton to dive into, and I want to talk about these offensive linemen that the Bengals got because I'm sure you're as excited as anyone to, to see them. But before we do that, what do you think about the AFC arms race? Because it has been about as wild of an off season. If you would have told me Devonte Adams would be on a new team and Tyreek Hill and Russell Wilson, and you know, all of these quarterbacks would be switching teams. We knew Watson was going somewhere. I didn't think he was going to end up in Cleveland. So what do you make of everything going on in this conference? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you, you look at the AFC North, the AFC West, I mean, geez, uh, the Bengals don't have the AFC West uh, as a whole on their schedule this season, which I guess would be a, a plan. You look at what Miami just did, you know, yeah. the Buffalo Bills, the Miami Dolphins. I mean, it, it's, it is an arms race. The Patriots are nothing to sneeze at because, you know, they've got uh, history and tradition and Bill Belichick. And, you know, that, that, so that division, you know, is, is a competitive one as well. Uh, whoever comes out of the AFC now is going to be, you know, battle tested for sure. Hopefully not too battered and bruised because, man, it's going to be – everybody's going to be beating each other up, like you said. Quarterback position uh, with receivers and running backs, skill positions are just, I mean, extraordinary on almost every roster. It's like, you know, the, you look at the Bengals' skill players and you say, boy, that's, I'd take that. Well, there's a lot of teams in the AFC that would take theirs as well. It's, it's crazy. So I think the fact that the Bengals beefed up the offensive line – uh, to to allow those players to execute it and even at a higher level uh, is is something um, that you know not to sneeze at for sure because I mean Joe Burrow started rewriting the Cincinnati Bengals record book uh, despite being sacked seventy times uh, and, you know if they if they can cut those those sacks in half or even down to forty from seventy to forty think of the numbers you know I mean I, I know it's like okay yeah this team this team you know won the AFC and advanced to the Super Bowl. Uh, and the offensive line was partly responsible. True. But if the offensive line uh, unit played at a higher level, where would this football team have been? I mean, how, how good could it have been offensively? And uh, we're about to find out, I think, with the additions that they made up front. And I want to dive into each of those additions, but y you mentioned Joe Burrow, and I, I think that's the where, where everybody was, right? Find a way to protect number nine. I said it a ton on this channel. I'm just, I'm sick of watching him limp. And I know he's still going to get hit, but I hate that he had to play through the pain and, and no, he didn't complain. And there's going to be times where he gets dinged up. Of course, it's part of football, but it just felt like it was happening every week, every other week, something was going on with him. What do you think this is going to do for him? Because I, I think back to that LSU year, and it's not like that, that line was amazing. I mean, they were good, but this is certainly going to be the best offensive line he's had uh, in the pros. So is there a, another level to Burrow's game after he, you're right, rewrote some of the Bengals records already? Yeah. I mean, I think there is, um, you know, it's, he, he, he basically is a tough guy. I mean, he's a tough, phys physically a tough guy, a tough minded guy. I mean, when he was at Ohio State and it didn't work out at the quarterback position, he asked Urban Meyer if he could cover kickoffs. You know, I mean, the Burrow family, his two brothers were linebackers at Nebraska. I mean, he's he's a football player mindset. He's not a prima donna. You know, I mean, he's he's a guy that appreciates the physicality of the game and and, and, and all of that. Um, but I mean, to give him an opportunity to manipulate and climb the pocket and he can still get out of the pocket and do all the things. He's got plenty of mobility. But when he's an extraordinary in the pocket as a pocket passer. And when you can give him time, you know, the tackles keep the pocket wide and the guard in the centers, uh, the, the, the two guards in the center keep the depth of the pocket where he can step up and manipulate and, and buy time and do the things that he can do. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's, I think it's crazy. There, there is still more, there's more to get, there's more upside. Um, you know, the two things in protection as a former lineman, you know, that we always were taught and it was talked about ad nauseum, not only giving the quarterback time, but giving the quarterback space, you know, and space to look and see down the football field and watch things develop and, and uh, be able to, you know, diagnose and, and make reads and all those kind of things. I mean, if you get guys in your face, 
you know, not only is it, is it, uh, you know, troublesome to think about going through your mechanics of throwing the football, following through and not hitting a helmet or a shoulder pad or a body or whatever, but you can't see. And these guys are big guys. So give the quarterback some space, some separation where you can see the football field. And if Joe Burrow can see the football field, man, it's lights out. Good night. Yeah. I, I, think everybody watching right now is dreaming of five-step drops where Burrow can sit back there for a second and, and throw darts, as CJ Uzama used to say. Uh, so it, they certainly uh, took uh, three big steps forward into doing that, into protecting him. And uh, let's dive into these guys a bit because uh, Lyle Collins, uh, you, you know, is a stud. I think we, we've known about him, even though you don't, you don't necessarily follow uh, the Cowboys offensive line when he became available and, and was actually released. And it, it became pretty clear that he wasn't going to, um, you know, no one was going to trade for him. Did you think he was going to land in Cincinnati right away? Did you anticipate it being uh, one of these things where maybe they get him, but he's going to visit multiple teams because he came to Cincinnati, what, late Thursday night? And he was here for about four days and, and inked the deal during that time. Yeah, I mean, uh, Duke Tobin and, and company weren't going to let him out, weren't going to let him out of the city. I mean, that wasn't going to happen. I think he had a, a scheduled visit to Miami, was going to be the, up next in the docket. He never made it there. Um, so he, he's, he is an upper crust offensive tackle. There's no doubt. He's, you know, he's amongst the upper echelon type guys. Uh, and you know, I, I do think the Frank Pollock uh, connection, the relationship, I, I, can, I can speak to the fact that your first offensive line coach you have in the National Football League always has a special place in your heart because, you know, he helped you make it. You know, it's like in getting drafted or in his case, he wasn't. And for, you know, circumstances that were difficult, he, he was a top 10 prospect in the draft. And uh, didn't get drafted, but he had that. He has that kind of athletic ability, and, and that ability as a football player. But when you get getting drafted is just, I mean, that that's the first part of it. Then you once you get there, you got to make it. And and it, I, I know LC is very very appreciative of the impact that Frank Pollock had on him and helping him prove that he could play in the National Football League and then play at a really high level in the National Football League. And you don't forget those things. I mean, my first offensive line coach, Bill Tiger Johnson, will always have a special spot in my heart. There's no doubt. Um, and, and, you know, he's fortunate in that he had, a, he had a really good one. I did as well. If you're not lucky and you go to a, an organization that doesn't have a very good line coach, it can kind of set you back. But if you have a good one, it can, you know, be a um, basically a, a catalyst to your career, you know, and jump started up very, very early. And so I think that relationship was very strong. And you compound that with Joe Burrow and the youth of the football team and all the other skilled players and the youth of those skilled players. And I, I think, I think the attraction was, uh, you know, was, was very, very strong and, and they ultimately uh, got the deal done and, and he, he looks for, I think he felt like he probably played his best football with Frank Pollock as his line coach. And he's excited and anxious to get back to working with Frank Pollock and see if uh, Frank can even take him to another level. And, you know, he, he basically, you know, just appreciated the work ethic and how, how Frank approached the game and how he approached practices and what he did at practices every single day. And he wants to get back into that grind. I mean, that's, that's, a, to me, that's a huge statement that LC wants to come and get back to work with Frank Pollock. So, here you have a, uh, a player that other players are going to look at and say, man, this guy's a stud. This guy can play. And then he's going to work his tail off with Frank Pollock. So he sets a high bar in terms of, man, you get, you know, you, you got you to grind, guys. It just doesn't happen. You don't walk out in the football field and play at a real high level. You got to put the work in. And you have the best player in the offensive line that totally believes in Frank and Frank's system, what he's doing. That's huge. That's, that's, that's massive. And you got a couple of other guys they signed that, you know, have proven that they can play in the national football league. And, you know, the, the, they've won, they got Super Bowl rings hanging off their fingers. So they have instantaneous credibility in that offensive line room too. You know, Karras has got two and Kappa has one that that's, that's credibility, man. So you've got, you got three guys 
that are in the prime of their career. You know, it's not like they're on the back nine and just, you know, struggling to hang on. They still have rubber on the tire. They got years left. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a much, much different offensive line room. And uh, the guys that are going to be leading that offensive line room have had big time success with, with uh, you know, successful organizations, obviously, and, and have gone to the pinnacle and won. You can't ask for much more than that. No, you can't. And one thing that I noticed uh, when Frank Pollock talked last week, uh, spe- specifically about Alex Kappa and Ted Karras, uh, was the fact that they, they blocked for Tom Brady in the, the drop back situations. And that's interesting to me because yeah, Burrow, you want to drop back when you have Jamar Chase and T Higgins and Tyler Boyd. Do you think that's going to uh, allow Zach Taylor and Brian Callahan to open up the playbook a little bit more and, and go to a part of it that maybe they had installed, but couldn't necessarily run given the limitations uh, in the offensive line room last season? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, I, I think it opens uh, doors, windows, everything you can open. It really, I think it really <laughs> does. You know, I mean, um, and, and, and that, that's true. Both of these guys were the part of the interior of offensive lines that were key components to Tom Brady's success. Because, like, Tom Brady is a statue. Tom Brady's not a mobile quarterback. Tom Brady will be the first one to tell you, I'm a pocket passer, period. I mean, that, that's what I am. But both of them uh, were very, very productive in a pass-heavy offense that was pocket oriented. So, you know, they, they understand um, the significance of keeping the depth of the pocket clean for, did it for Tom Brady. And if you can do it for Joe Burrow, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll reward you like Tom Brady will rewarded you. So I think that um, both of these interior guys and Collins too, watching all these guys on tape, you can tell when an offensive lineman's aware of what's going on in front of them in terms of stunts where linemen are, you know, uh, twisting and, and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of activity going on. There might be a linebacker blitzing and a lineman twisting behind him. And you have to be, you have to apply your rules. Are we, are we passing it off? Is it a zone uh, pick up on this or do we stay man? And, you know, does guy, one guy stay on the penetrator, the other guy work around him to get the loop or do we pass off the penetrator and looper? And, you know, they're very aware of things going on up in front uh, at, at the, in the pits at the line of scrimmage. And uh, I, I, I've done a podcast with, with both of the interior guys uh, on, on in the trenches with Dave Lappin brought to you by First Star Logistics. And both of those guys, one thing that was, was apparent is their awareness, you know, and uh, that was something that was really kind of a problem for the Bengals down the stretch and in the playoffs were these defensive lines that had good talent and not only able to bull rush you, but then complement it with stunts and twists and all those kind of things. So uh, I, I think everything's going to be so much cleaner, a lot cleaner, and it, it allows you to you know, become a lot more sophisticated in your run game and your passing game with, uh, with guys like that that can handle it mentally and are so, are so aware. You know, you're limited by um, – if you've got four offensive linemen that are above average in terms of awareness and that sort of thing, you have one that's not, you have to dumb it down to the one that's not. I mean, because that guy can't, he can't get there. He can't, uh, you're not going to be able to drill a hole in his head and inject knowledge, you know? So now you've got a bunch of guys that are very aware up there, very, very intelligent. And that, that, that opens up, like I said, all kinds of doors, windows, and all, all kinds of things. It's going to be interesting to see how these guys, um, they'll put work in. They're all pros, pros. That's the other thing. You know, they, they, they've been around the league enough to know what it takes, but they're not too old, but they've, they've, they've got just the right amount of experience and they know what you have to do and what it's supposed to look like. And they'll work. They'll work to get it done. And they, re- they understand you don't just line up next to each other the first day of training camp and say, okay, we got it all figured out, man. It takes a lot of, a lot of reps and you got to put the work in. And I know all three of these guys will put the work in. There's no doubt. And speaking of putting the the work in, I know there were at least some questions uh, about Jackson Carmen's work ethic. And that's where I want to go next. Not necessarily just Jackson Carmen, but the left guard spot, because it feels like 
that could be and, and likely will be an open competition where you got Deontay Smith, you got Carmen, maybe you have another draft pick or, you know, a veteran that they sign in, in the coming weeks. It, do you anticipate it being a competition? And if so, what are the, the factors right now? And I get it. We're only in March, but the things that you're looking toward with these guys are, are the things that matter most in a potential competition between a Smith, Carmen, and maybe some of these other guys. Well, if I'm last year, the Bengals take Smith in the second round. I'm mean, excuse me, Carmen in the second round, Smith in the fourth, and Hill in the sixth. Yep. So I'm saying, okay, year one to year two is normally one of the biggest growth, and I I do believe that. Haven't gone through it. Your your rookie year, you don't know what you don't know, and and some guys pick it up a lot more quickly than others, and it doesn't take their entire rookie year to pick it up. But, you know, some some players, it takes all of that rookie year. And these three guys were drafted for a reason. They spent, let's just look at the offensive line, what they've done the last two years. Last year's draft, they heavy offense, obviously, and heavy offensive line. They, they, they addressed the defense in free agency, free agency. This year, they addressed the offense, three signed. Last year, they draft three offensive linemen. This year, they signed three offensive linemen in free agency. Well, hell, that's six bodies right there. Mm-hmm. On game day, he only activates, you know, seven or eight. So in, in, in a draft in a free agency period, which is really less than a year apart, <laughs> they, they brought in six new bodies. So the three rookies that were drafted, if I'm one of those rookies, I'm saying, all right, well, they drafted me for a reason. The, the position that's available right now is the left guard position. All three of them should say, I'm a candidate for that left guard position and I'm going to fight and battle my ass off to be the left guard in this offensive line. Cause now I understand what the NFL is all about. I've been through it for a year. I understand what the preparation is like. I understand the differences between the college game and the pro game a little bit more now. I mean, I, I get it. Now I have to really, now I have to go start to establish my career. Which one of those three guys is going to step up? Mm-hmm. And like you said, Maybe not just those three guys. Maybe uh, there'll be a draft pick or a college free agent or whatever the case may be that's that's in there competing as well. Um, you know, maybe maybe uh, Hill shows that he's advanced so much at center they feel pretty good with with him at center and they move can move Karras to left guard. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm Hill, I'm like I, I got to try to find a place somewhere. I'm ready. I'm, I'm going to go. Hill has some physical abilities to him. His lower body is like it's it's unique. There's no question about it. I mean, all, all these kids, Deontay Smith uh, was making a big impression until he got injured. You know, and, and Jackson Carmen has to, you know, has to progress his game. Physically, he's, he's extremely talented. And one snap will be like, oh, my God. And then the next snap, like, what's he doing? So, you know, the consistency and all of that has to, uh, you know, has to be honed and sharpened. But, I mean, it is. It's a free-for-all at that left guard position. And if I'm any one of those guys, it's like, man, this is, this is my job. It's time to go compete for it. And I got to play at the highest level I possibly can. And competition breeds excellence performance. There's no doubt about it. Let me ask you this. And it's the last thing uh, that that I have for you, Dave. And I appreciate the time when they signed Ted Karras, the first thing I probably noticed outside of the Super Bowl rings was his versatility. And you just mentioned that flexibility of him potentially going from center to left guard if they needed him to. He's obviously uh, has experience doing that. What if, a, in, in looking ahead now, the draft about five weeks away, what if a Linderbaum is there at 31? And I know there's arm length concerns and things like that, but it seems like all these NFL evaluators love his athleticism on tape. There's other centers, I think, in the second through fourth rounds that could be available as well that maybe the Bengals like. Do you think that's a, a possibility that, that they could go center in the draft? And then that way they, they bolster their, their youth in the offensive line room. And they also have a guy that they sign that can play multiple spots on the interior. Yeah. I mean, I think anything's a possibility. Um, Linderbaum is, is went to Iowa. That's where they manufacture offensive linemen. You know, their techniques are always impeccable and, and uh, they, they learn how to play football the right way up front in the pits. There's no, no two ways about it. 
I think I saw where his arms are like 31 inches. And that is, that's dramatic yeah. <laughs> in terms of, uh, of being able to handle, but obviously in high school and at the collegiate level, his athleticism and his ability to get with his feet, his, his good, quick feet, his ability to get his body in position has overcome the, the reach problem because, you know, now you're getting up against another level of athlete who might be a little bit quicker and starting now, all of a sudden the reach becomes maybe more of an issue because you can't get to that advantageous spot against these better players. You know, now your arms become, you know, maybe a little bit more of a problem, the arm length. So it, he's, he's found ways to overcome it with his athleticism. Do you feel like, can you project him to find ways to overcome it? And some guys, a lot of other guys have, I mean, there are, there are guys that have played in the national football, league with shorter arms than you'd like to have uh they have they have other attributes that uh, compensate do you do you project his other ap- attributes to be able to compensate for that you know so obviously he's been able to do it at the collegiate level at a very high level the guy is uh, he's a projected first round draft pick so that's that speaks volumes right there but you know i, I think by signing three offensive linemen in free agency um you've you've given yourself a lot of flexibility to me sitting there at 31 literally um, is the, is the, the best cornerback. Is he higher on my board than the center? Is he higher on my board than an interior or a tackle interior offensive lineman or a tackle? Uh, is he on, is he higher on my board than an interior defensive lineman or an edge rush guy? I, it gives them, you know, their biggest need was addressed and addressed very heavily and very well and, uh, and didn't overspend to do it, you know, as another thing. Um, they were able to get a three for, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, they, they did a good job. So now it's like, trust your board, trust the guys that have evaluated uh, your board. And man, it's like, wh- whoever slides, jump on it. Whoever slides, jump on it. Now, now you're in a situation where you're, you know, you're, you're just basically, uh, you, you might uncover a hidden starter somewhere. You may be improving your depth dramatically, um, but you, you, you're not stuck at, I have to take this guy no matter what, because I don't have anybody that can play center. I got to take mm-hmm. this guy, whether I think he can do it or not. I got to take him. He's the best guy available. You know, even though you've got questions about him, they're not in that situation. So, yeah, I think Karras's versatility is huge and, um, he's, he's got really good NFL reps on tape at right guard, left guard and center. Yeah. I would be surprised just kind of handicapping the, the 31st overall pick. And obviously their pro days are still, there's plenty of pro days happening across the country and numbers could change, but if it isn't an offensive lineman, I think it has to be defense. They're obviously not going to go receiver or right. they don't need a quarterback tight end. I don't see any tight ends worthy of the 31st overall pick. I would be surprised if that's right. the route they go. So to me, I agree with you. I mean, if it isn't one of these linemen that fall, you know, at the top of their board corner, uh, it, defensive line, interior or edge, or it, maybe even a safety could be the best player on the board. Like I think anything is possible, but I I'd certainly would lean defense if I had to guess today. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see with the Jesse Bates scenario, how high do they take a safety? You know, how high do they have the safeties rated? Um, you know, if, if in fact it can't work out, it doesn't work out with, uh, with Jesse, you know, you're going, to have to, you're going to have to address that. And when do you, do you address it before the fact or after the fact or whatever the fact? You know, hopefully you don't have to address it at all. But, um, you know, that, that, that's an interesting scenario to think about. And, uh, it, you know, if the safety does slide where, you know, that's, that's the b- best player on the board, I don't think it'll be in the first round, but I, I could mm-hmm. see it potentially, you know, second or third. I guess he's second rounder himself, you know, I mean, could see it potentially, uh, you know, potentially part of the evaluation process. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to, all I can say is that uh, they have done a really, really good job in, in keeping up with the arms race by improving the offensive line because they already had talent. That uh, they can, you know, they can compete with these AFC teams. It, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. I mean, there's there's going to be really good football teams that don't even make the playoffs. You know, that can on any every any given Sunday could beat a playoff team in the AFC, but it just didn't work out that way during the course of the season. And man, 
They are. They're gonna. They're, it's gonna be. It's gonna be a battle royale. It's it, the amount of talent that came from the NFC to the AFC in this off season. Boy, and, and, and up front, uh, quarterbacks, uh, skilled players. Otherwise, it, it's it's remarkable. It really is. The AFC had a hell of a run, man. <laughs> it did. It did. It's it's going to be wild. It's it's certainly going to be fun. And and this was a lot of fun as well. So make sure you check out in the trenches with Dave Lapham. Dave, always a, a joy to talk to you, man. I appreciate the time. My pleasure, James. Have a good one, sir.